This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is a glorious week in sports because, of course, we've got the men's and the women's tournaments going on. We've got that, of course. We've got the Masters just around the corner. But on Thursday, MLB opening day is finally here. We're going to talk about the futures market, break down some futures you can lock in before opening day arrives by talking to Tom Vecchio and picking his brain around futures he likes across all of Major League Baseball for this year. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as mentioned by Tom Vecchio. You can find him on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom and Tom. You're glowing today. Quinnipiac uh, has advanced to Tampa uh, in the men's hockey tournament. So, A, congratulations. B, how are we feeling about uh, the next round for Quinnipiac? Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I'm doing great. Yeah, a couple big wins over the weekend versus Merrimack and Ohio State. Uh, college hockey isn't for everyone, but uh, should uh, be. Yeah, it should be. Move, moving on to the Frozen Four, which is always good. Uh, you know, Rangers are rolling. Yankee season starts. Everything's everything's coming up, Tom. <laughs> Everything is coming up, Tom, and uh, I'm excited for you as someone who doesn't get to enjoy a lot of like college sports level success. I'm glad to live vicariously through you for this one sport. You know, between the two of us, we've got two sports. You've got hockey. I've got women's lacrosse. We can, you know, we'll, we're slowly building up the trophy chest. Uh, if we combine, maybe we'll eventually have the might of one school. I mean, it's true. Like Northwestern is good in football or like okay in football. And they're always hanging around in basketball, um, which are, I mean, you know, Q doesn't have a, a football team. So yeah, I, I can't have that. Hey, they still won as many games in the U S as Northwestern did this year. So there, there is always that, but congratulations, Tom, I'm excited for you for that. Uh, good luck to them in the next couple of rounds. We're going to dig in today and talk about Everything MLB futures. Pick Tom's brain around assumptions entering this year. We're going to talk player awards. We'll talk season long props, league leaders, team level stuff, and a whole lot more. We'll dive into that with Tom here in just one second. But first, as a reminder, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Tomorrow, Dr. Ed Feng will be with us to break down the men's final four, breaking down what he sees there. We're going to talk some women's Final Four coming up on Thursday as well. On Wednesday, I'll break down what my numbers are saying across opening day in Major League Baseball. I'll have that up a day early, assuming props are up, which they should be. And then a lot of good stuff here across the entire week. So search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. We are almost to the end of the tournament now, but there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. You can wager on everything from the money line to point spreads to which team will be cutting down the net all in an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So... Don't miss your shot at a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and y And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now, Tom, we'll talk about some specific markets here in a second, but I did want to talk overall about an approach we can have when it comes to betting in general, but also specifically with futures. That's where you make assumptions going in. You know, if you assume X, that could transit. You assume that ball is dead, that could lead to unders on every single home run prop, stuff like that. So I want to talk to you. 
when you're looking at 2023 specifically with baseball, are there any assumptions you're making going in that are influencing the way you view these futures markets? Initially, I want to say I'm optimistic that we will see more scoring based on the rule changes yeah. with, uh, you know, the pitch clock and the larger bases, which, you know, may not seem like a big deal, but we obviously have data from the minor leagues last year about what that does for stolen base attempts and stolen base, stolen base success rate. And that means more runs, et cetera, et cetera. But then we also have to deal with the ball. Like is regardless of what the rule changes are, if the ball is still going to be dead, then we're not going to be seeing a lot of runs. And one of the things uh, when it comes to the pitch clock that, you know, we spoke about, last week just uh you know us back and forth is you know what does that mean for pitchers and in terms of the cadence of the pitcher and a hitter being ready because if the hitter's not ready are they going to be getting you know what i'm going to be calling quote unquote free strikes mm. does that mean a pitcher is getting free strikes or free strikeouts that means we're they're going to be keeping their pitch count low which could indicate the overs on you know pitcher strikeout props at least right. early in the season until we fall into some rhythm and there's really shouldn't take that long as we discussed like probably only should take like maybe a week maybe even less than that or is there going to be some type of data that suggests okay there is an issue with batters being ready and thus pitchers are getting free strikes so their workload is low and they're still getting free strikeouts now that may may even out so i'm optimistic about there being offense but i'm also hesitant about how much the pitch clock will impact that in terms of actually seeing production on the field yeah, the pitch clock thing to me is the most important thing outside of like the the base thing. Because I think that'll be like if you're betting like stolen base props, that could be huge. Um, I think sports books will be aware of it, but like, you know, look into it is what I would say there. As far as the pitch clock thing with strikeout rates, looking at um, spring data, and this is a bit outdated because I haven't pulled it in a while. But um, at one point, spring strikeout rates were actually down 0.8 percentage points from where they were last year. Now, the question is, is that due to pitch clocks or is that due to World Baseball Classic um, siphoning away some talent and making things kind of be a bit more odd? So I don't know is the answer. Um, I'm not sure who is it who gains an advantage from this. Right, and right, that's right. kind of like the the hang up is I know there is an assumption to be had here. I just don't know on which side of it I want to be. I would say that there's an opportunity early in the season. Like if you are if you're willing to bet overs early in the season on, on pitcher strikeouts game by game because you think that the pitch clock will be an issue for hitters. That could lead to free strikes. That means they get free strikeouts. And then mm-hmm. as those as the weeks go on, those lines get adjusted. A pitcher was at five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half, but really not those strikeouts he was getting aren't all quote unquote real. Yeah. Then you start betting unders. Right. Because the line is gonna be overinflated. People are gonna be seeing that. And then you can you gotta wait for the market to swing back. So it's it's a wait and see. <laughs> like you said, there's an there's an edge for someone, you just don't know who it is. And uh, with regards to the free strikes you're talking about, that is accurate based on what happened in the minors last year, where it started off where there were more pitch clock violations per game early on, and then they slowly dwindled away. So it could be a situation where it's exactly what you said, where it's a bigger thing earlier on than it is later. And I think that's one thing to keep keep an eye on, uh, be aware of, you know, right. try to identify who has benefited from some fluky stuff uh, and stuff like that, for sure. And you know, tracking how hitters adjust, uh, because that'll be an important thing for them as well. Okay, let's dig into some futures here, Tom, and talk about uh, the league leaders markets. Uh, you can bet on who will lead the league in home runs, strikeouts, stolen bases, if you want to go that way as well. When you look at those markets, anything stand out to you as being a good value? Yeah, I have options for all of those. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> let's, let's go. Let's start, <laughs> let's start off with home runs. Uh, Matt Olson, 28 to 1. Uh, last year, he finished 11th in the league with 34 home runs. The year before that, he was 6th with 39 home runs. He's been having a great spring. You look at all of his underlying numbers. His ISO is great, good contact rate, fly ball rate, hard contact, X slugging X wool, but like you name it, he has all of these possibilities. Now, you know, we're looking at this list and in terms of, you know, who's going to lead the league. And mm-hmm. we obviously want a combination of probability to actually do it. And then are the odds actually good? Right. Where Aaron Judge could absolutely do it. He could have 55 home runs, and that which would be regressing from last year. <laughs> but I have no interest in that number. Right. And, you know, Pete Alonso 
is there for me, but I don't think the number is long enough yet. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of interest in York Don, but he's, you know, ha- he's had a late start to the spring. He has this wrist injury, whatever it is, didn't start swinging until late. Austin Riley w- would be there for me as well. Yeah, because I'm, I'm big on Austin Riley this year. We'll get to him as well. But I, I don't know if that number is long enough. So there's a lot to consider. And I think Matt Olson is that perfect combina- combination of we have seen really good home run upside from him in the past two years. He has a great number and he has all of the underlying metrics we can possibly want. He's also in a very good park for hitting, yeah, which is great. kind of why I was surprised last year didn't go better for him. Going from Oakland to Atlanta, that's a pretty big home run park factor upgrade. And it didn't really manifest in terms of the way things went. But was that due to change in teams? Was that due to some other stuff? Uh, the truncated spring may have impacted him more than others. There are a lot of factors that could have led to that. But still 34 home runs last year. He was not bad. Um, but I think that there is that upside, especially, again, giving him a second year in that park. There is definitely a route to him lighting things up in year two. Right. And I also love that line. It's not like they can pitch around him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> He's going to see good pitches. Like, you want to. Yeah, who do you around, pitch around? <laughs> you want to pitch around Olsen to get to Riley? Like, Alcuna's already on base. Like, that's not it's not an easy thing. Yeah, they've got uh, Riley is 20 to 1 here, Acuna 27, Olsen 28. It's pretty sick. Uh, with the Alvarez one you were mentioning, I agree with you where that's a concern not just because he's had the slow start but because it's a hand injury right. like i was going to have a checklist of like injuries that worry me for batters obliques oh, yeah. always worry me hand injuries and wrist by you know connection there yeah. if it's like a you know if it's something else a minor ding that in the lower body somewhere i'm not going to care as much when they come back but obliques hand injuries those are massive red flags for me I would also say Julio Rodriguez at 35 to one is interesting just because that number's so long and yeah. his power upside is uh, very clear. I wrote about him uh, article published last week on number fire uh, about his season total home run props, which we will all also get to in a, in a little bit. Okay. I'm not going to spoil that one. Let's talk here about the strikeout leaders. What you got there? I have two and that could be one Aaron Nola at 15 to one and Shane McClanahan at 35 to one. And Ooh. Nola last year, fourth most strikeouts at 235, uh, year before that, eighth with 230, 223. And, you know, strong 29% strikeout rate over the past few years. He's got like a 12% swinging strikeout rate. The innings are always there for him. He's consistent. He's going deep into games. We have a, kind of like everything that we possibly want. At, Cole is up there. Again, his number's not long enough. You know, we're looking at some of these options at the top of the board. It's like, yeah, like I'm not going to be surprised if these pitchers finish one, two, three when it comes to, right. uh, you know, total strikeouts leading the league. But those numbers just aren't long enough. Like, I have a ton of interest in Burns this year. I think Cease, I think that number's a little bit, that number's not long enough, even remotely for me. Uh, Strider, I think, is not long enough. And sure, could he get there? He probably could, but I just don't like that number. So I have interest in Burns if, that number was 12 to one, but not at eight to one. Uh, both Burns and Nola contract years. Uh, that's oh, kind of right. fun. A um, little bit of uh, incentive juice there. And I think with McClanahan, um, 35 to one, as you mentioned, it's kind of just an assumption, going back to that word, an assumption that they give him more leash, which they did right. down the stretch last year. Um, his like, t- I mean, I, I know it tapered off towards the end once they were getting towards the playoffs, but you look at his his length in June, July, stuff like that, they were letting it go deeper in games. So I think that if you kind of assume now that his innings are built up more, that could be the path to getting there with him. Right. He's got, a, I mean, last year was a 30% strikeout rate and he had a 15.5% swing strike rate, which is, which is awesome. He's very good. Yeah. Uh, he did deal with uh, an injury late at the end of last season. I forget what it was. I, mm. I'm not really worried about that because he has shown the consistency, at least at that portion of the season to get deep into games. And he's nasty. And at 35 to 1, I think, is is really solid. Yeah. Uh, looking at McClanahan during the spring, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty small sample. 10 strikeouts, 9 and 2 thirds innings. So not popping there in that regard, but that's not always the best indicator. And it's 35 to 1 for a guy who we know is a freak. So I think that's uh, pretty enticing as well. Okay. Uh, you said you got a stolen base person yeah. as well. Who's that? One real quick one. Uh, the numbers on, on most of these players up at the top are okay. Uh, I think Mullins at 11 to one is at least interesting given what he's yeah. done 
I think the Orioles are going to be a really interesting team this year with Rutschman and Henderson and the talent that they had, the young talent that they have. Uh, Mullins was top four in the past two years in stolen bases. And, uh, you know, with, with the increase in size in stolen bases and like all this data from last year, it puts him in a really good spot. And if the Orioles are going to be, I want to say, a, like confidently and like aggressive on offense, like whatever you want to call it, because they have this youth that they want to like show off their offense. Their pitching is still suspect. I think they need to like push the offense to keep themselves in game. Sometimes I think Mullins is really interesting this year. He's 11 to one. Uh, the guy who interests me is Corbin Carroll, 15 to one. Uh, just got a huge contract extension. Yeah. Um, and I know it's always like, Oh, you're, you're on this, this rookie is coming up. Um, you don't know if he'll adjust. We, we saw him last year and he was awesome. Um, 27% strikeout rate, a bit higher than you want to be, but I don't know. I, I think that I think that Mullins, I love Cedric Mullins a talent, so I'm on board with from that perspective. The other one that I like is Carroll. I think a 15 to 1 is is pretty fun as well. Okay, let's shift focus now and talk about um some uh season-long player props. They have over-unders in terms of strikeouts for some guys. Um uh they've got home runs. What tickles your fancy in those markets, Tom? Uh going back to one of the players I mentioned, J Rod, Julio Rodriguez over 27 and a half home runs he had 28 last year and he only played uh 134 games last year i think it was and you know he dealt with the back injury at the end of the season he had the wrist injury all these sorts of things uh he also got a massive contract extension so if he's at 28 last year in 135 games let's call it and he stays healthy he should be cruising over this number and again another player i i wrote him up in full on the article on on number fire uh on why i'm i'm looking at him and he's in the top you know 90 95th percentile or higher in you know, average eggs of velocity, max eggs of velocity, X slugging, like stat after stat after stat. Yes, it's not the best hitters park in the league being in Seattle, but his power is undeniable. He's going to get plenty of plate appearances. He's going to be constantly in good spots. Love J-Rod this year. He also did that. It's important to remember, I talked about like red flag injuries. He had one uh, right. mid-season and he came back. And he was still awesome. Like, I wanted to be skeptical when he came off the IL, being like, okay, it's a hand injury. I want to be low. And then he's like, nope, you're good. Just constantly, like, reinforcing, like, you don't got to worry about me. I'm fine. Uh, so he did the 20 home runs despite a hand injury midseason, which is absurd. So I, I love that about him, too. With him, do you think that you want to go with, like, this market? Or do you want to go with a higher upside one, like an MVP, stuff like that? I feel like this one's probably the best one just because he's not competing with Shohei Otani. Um, and then the home run one, he's not competing with like Aaron Judge and all those guys. So I think this is probably the best market. Did you give consideration to him elsewhere? Uh, not really. I, I yeah. think that this is the spot. Like if you told me Trout was up there top two along with Otani for MVP, like I'm, I'm yeah. never going to say no. And right. I don't want to like lose out on what I think He's gonna be an awesome year for him just because right. he's facing such stuff, stuff com yeah, such yeah. Just a tough competition. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Any other uh individual over unders you like, Tom? Christian Javier over 199 and a half. And last year he had 194 strikeouts and he only pitched 148 innings, mm -hmm. nearly 25 starts last year. And most of the league leaders were up at 30, 32, 33 starts, uh, having you know 200 plus innings that we saw from Cole and we saw from Burns and if he's at 194 and he's 50 innings behind them, even if his rate decreases on a per inning basis, right. it, we still see the volume of innings increase and he gets up to even 180. He doesn't even have to touch 200. I think that this is a, a really fair line. It's projectable in terms of what he's done. It's not the largest sample size in the world. He did have some appearances at the bullpen last year before he, you know, he's full-time, in the starting rotation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that this is a, a pretty fair line for Javier this year. I think the encouraging thing is you're not making a projection based on that strikeout rate. We've seen him as a starter over a long period, and the strikeouts were there even as he was going deeper into games. Uh, as you mentioned, 194 strikeouts last year, 148 in two-thirds innings. He was a beast. Um, and I think that their, their faith in him has gone up, which is, A, justified, but also, B, should increase our willingness to check him out in these markets. Okay, before we finish up players, Tom, did want to ask you about the awards market. I don't tend to be a big awards market better, as we discussed with Rodriguez. I, you know, I have a hard time ever voting against Shohei Otani. So that's why I don't tend to dabble in these markets too much. But looking at uh, the MVP, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year, whatever it may be, 
Any players you view as being undervalued across those markets? Yeah, I have a few. Uh, so I'll, I'll just rattle them off pretty quickly. Uh, one would be Austin Riley. As I mentioned, he can basically go head to head with anyone in the NL when it comes in. Riley's at 16 to one. Uh, basically go head to head with anyone in the NL when it comes to his hitting stats. I think that's very clear. Again, the offense around him is going to constantly put him in good spots. Pitchers are not going to be able to pitch around him. Great hitters park. We know the team's going to be good. He's going to have all these numbers to back it up. I have interest in Arenado as well at 12 to one. And while I don't expect him to have as much power as some of the other players, not as much as Riley, maybe not as, as much as Pete Alonso. I think that Arenado 12 to one, like he's always going to have that gold glove, like sitting yeah. there waiting for him in, his, in the back pocket, which is just such a, such a good thing to have when you're like, wow, this player is nearly there in every single hitting category. Not to mention the fact that he has a gold glove as well, which I think is only a positive for Arenado. So Riley and Arenado are are really interesting in the NL. In the AL, I would have interest in Jordan at 12 to 1. Again, it comes down to his health, and which yeah. we already discussed. And I think uh, uh, J Ram at, at 15 to 1 for Cleveland. I think that number's too long given what he does on such a consistent basis. And I think that the lack of the success from Cleveland often hampers him when it comes to that market overall. And I don't think that lack of success will be there this year. I kind of like the Guardians. I know last year my betting model was on them a lot in the second half of the year. Uh, if I look at like my like my power rankings right now, they're pretty high. Um, and for that division, if you're pretty, if you if you are a good team in that division, you can do a lot of damage. So I think the team will be good. And we know he'll be good. Right. You combine those two things together, 15-1. to 1, Again, I, I can't personally bet against Shohei Otani because it just feels like morally bankrupt. But um, like I think that Ramirez is the kind of guy you'd want to turn to if you were betting against Otani, thinking maybe there's an injury, stuff like that. So that's, that's a spot that I'm really interested in. When it comes to the Cy Young markets, I'm going to be back on Nola at 13-1, to 1, which is mm -hmm. pretty borderline of the, the lowest number I would go. Just given the level of competition in the NL, especially with Verlander moving over, it doesn't make anything uh, doesn't make things easier for Nola. But I think thirteen to one is is pretty interesting, especially that you said he's in contract here. I didn't realize that. Um, so I'm I'm on board with that. In the AL, Luis Castillo at sixteen to one has my eye. You know, if Degrom stays healthy, him moving from the NL to the AL doesn't make things easier for anyone. But I do like Luis Castillo. And then my long shot for Cy Young would be Tyler Glass now at 41 to 1. And I know he's not healthy right now, but he's not going to miss too much time to start the season. If we look back to 2021, he was on pace for the AL Cy Young before he got hurt. He was awesome at the beginning portion of the season. And I, I just don't, I think that number is kind of wrong, assuming he can come back and be along the same lines of where he was. This was the year before that in 2020, uh, but that was the COVID year. And Glass now is my favorite pitcher to watch because every time he pitched, he'd say the F word um, and there were no fans. <laughs> so you could hear it really well. Um, so he's my favorite pitcher because of that, basically. And yeah, I mean, like he's not going to start the year right away. I don't care as much about obliques with pitchers that I do with hitters personally. That's the injury he has right now. But um, I think that given what he can do from a strikeout perspective, 41 to one is at least interesting there uh, with glass now. And hopefully it can be glass later glass ever present as always. Okay. Let's finish up here, Tom, with some team level props. Uh, what are you seeing in those markets at FanDuel? All right. So this is something that we discussed uh, last week, just one-on-one -on -one between us. And this is uh, not, I'm using the angels as an example here, but I want to mm -hmm. use this, uh, theory overall on how to view futures markets. So the Angels are plus 146 to make the playoffs. And their win total is at 82 and a half, and it's minus 115 on the over. For the Angels, there's also alternate markets. And the uh, to win 90 plus games, the mm -hmm. Angels are at plus 250. So we have three different things going on here. To make the playoffs is yes or no question. Is that plus 146? Yes, to make it. Over 82 and a half is at minus 115. And to win 90 plus, is that plus 250? So let's say someone's interested in uh, you know, betting on to make the playoffs at 146, plus 146. If we look back, 89 wins was the average of the three AL wildcard teams last year, and 90.8 wins was the average for both leagues last year. 
It was 92 average the year before that. Only two teams made it, obviously, with the shift. That was AL only. And in 2019, it was 95 wins uh, to make the two wildcard teams AL only again. So what are we looking at here? If the Angels are going to make the playoffs, they need to have 90-plus wins. So at 90-plus wins is at plus 250. Mm -hmm. So instead of betting them to make the playoffs at plus 146, which I think is a fair number given the division that they're in, given the competition that they're going to have to face to win the wild card, if you are interested, why not just bet them at 90-plus wins at plus 250? And this is a theory that I've talked about in over the past few years with you is it's not about being right. It's about being the most right. So the Angels do, in fact, make the playoffs via the wild card. I don't expect them to beat the Astros in that division. They're going to need to have 90 plus wins. So why not go for plus 250 rather than, you know, plus 146? Now, of course, there's scenarios where they have 90 plus wins and they don't make the playoffs. There's a scenario where, oh, you could have just bet them over 82 and a half wins and gotten that and they still don't make the playoffs, but at least you got the win. Like there's so many permutations to this. But again, I'm always shooting for the most upside where it's going to be at plus 250. Yeah. And uh, the 90 plus wins market is the one you're talking about there with the plus 250. I think that that does make sense too, because if you look at the wild card situation, um, it is kind of dicey. So like, I'm, I'm not expecting a 90 plus win team to miss the playoffs, but like when you've got, okay, let's assume that the Yankees uh, win their division. Let's assume the guardians win and the Astros win. You've still got the Rays, Mariners, Blue Jays, all in that mix White to Sox. potentially scoop up wild cards. Twins. Right. Yeah. Well, I mm. can't talk about that. But that's, but that's my whole point. It's like if if they are going to make the playoffs, they need to have 90 plus wins. Right. It's, it's not going to be them making the playoffs with 87 wins. Yes, they hit right. the over on their season total. Congrats. And if you're on board with that, that's awesome. But if you are saying, OK, it, they have to make moves at the deadline because Otani is not it hasn't resigned yet and all these sorts of things. Like if that's the premise that you're going under then the route is to go plus 250 rather than plus 146. And I think that they have upside too. They've got like a lot of volatile players, which is why I think that it makes sense to go with a more volatile market because their pitching rotation has a lot of guys who are fun. I think Patrick Sandoval is fun. Otani, fun. Uh, Reed Detmers Detmers. really did improve last year. And then Jose Suarez, I think is underrated a little bit, at least. Their bullpen kind of sucks, but like... They got lotto tickets um, in the bullpen or in the rotation. Hunter Renfro, not really a lotto ticket, but he's fun. Um, so they've got some guys who are kind of interesting. And I think that going for an upside market does make sense for them there. So the Angels, a team, Tom is on again, 90 plus wins, plus 250 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Tom, we went a little bit long, uh, but I, I I appreciate you taking time to chat for today. I'm going to let you go. I got to do uh, recapping last week, but Tom, appreciate the time. Check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. You can find him, of course, over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed talking uh, NBA with the Daily ISO. Tom, have a fantastic day. Looking forward to talking to you again about hockey, baseball, basketball, all again here in the very near future. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom and check out again the Daily ISO over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy podcast feed. Again, got a recap last week here on the show because, you know, we do this for transparency uh, to try to let you know if what we're saying is worthwhile. Also, last week was pretty good. So let's uh, run through what happened last week here on the show. Starting off with the men's college basketball tournament. Back on Tuesday, we had Dr. Ed Fang on to preview the Thursday games in the Sweet 16. And uh, you can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. Ed had a couple of spreads he liked. Those were Gonzaga plus two and a half and Creighton minus nine and a half. And Gonzaga won outright in that game. They were covering plus two and a half even before that crazy three at the end. So pretty comfortable bet there for Ed. I know in the first half it wasn't as comfortable, but uh, still cash regardless via the outright win for Gonzaga. Creighton won by 11, so they covered uh, the 9.5 number as well. So good reads by Ed on both of those games. We'll talk to Ed tomorrow to preview the Final Four on the men's side. On Friday's show, our guest was Austin Cass. You can find Austin on Twitter, at Austin Cass, and he nailed everything. Really great week from Austin. Uh, For the Saturday games in the Elite Eight, he had the UConn money line at minus 130 and the FAU money line at plus 106. They both won. That's good. And it would have been fine if that had been all Austin had given us. We'd be very happy with Austin. We thank Austin for his service. But when we talk futures, the two that Austin highlighted, under the assumption that Alabama might have been a bit overrated in the market, 
He said he liked Creighton at plus a 50 to win it all and San Diego State at 40 to 1 to win it all. Of course, San Diego State is now uh, in the final four. They are the second most likely team to win it all based on FanDuel Sportsbook's odds. They are plus 360. So 40 to 1 to plus 360, that is bananas. So Austin is on vacation the next week, but kudos him for nailing things across the board there, both with the individual games and the futures. If you did take San Diego State 40 to 1, got chances to hedge and stuff like that. So awesome read by Austin. Hopefully you got in on that one before those games got underway. Uh, recapping NASCAR stuff for me, we'll go chronological here, beginning with the truck series on uh, Saturday earlier on. These things I've mentioned were Kyle Busch to win plus 150, Ross Chastain to win 12 to 1. Those numbers closed. Uh, Bush was like minus... I don't know. He's like minus 200 almost at some point, uh, minus 150, somewhere around there. I don't know. That is a big difference there, but he was very uh, likely to win. Chastain closed at two to one, I believe, plus 220 potentially. So big movement there. Neither guy won. Zane Smith won. But luckily, the top fives did well. Uh, the top fives highlighted were Ross Chastain, uh, plus 140. Parker Kligerman, plus 225. Ty Majeski, plus 225. Stuart Friesen, four to one. Grant Enfinger, four to one. Both Majeski and Chastain did finish top five. Uh, Chastain finished fifth. Majeski finished third. I think that Chastain had a shot to win that race, if not for a fuel pump issue that he had. It kind of ruined his day. So would have been nice to have the 12 to one on the win. But luckily, the top five was there. And the Majeski top five was as well. Kyle Busch finished second behind Zane Smith in that race. In Xfinity, uh, following that race on Saturday, the things I had going in were Cole Custer to win 8-1. to one, Brandon Jones to win 80 to one and Alex LeBay uh, top five at plus 1600. None of those came close. It was honestly pretty disappointing. Uh, the way that Jones ran, he was never super competitive that entire day. Custer had to start in the back and it took him a while to get back to the front. He wound up being fine eventually, but then had some issues towards the end. So, you know, the read on Xfinity was not as good as it was with the truck series. Finally, the cup series on Sunday, uh, three to or four top 10 markets. I discussed, uh, we had Michael McDowell top 10 at plus 165, Kevin Harvick at plus 175, Ty Gibbs at plus 430, Ryan Priest at seven to one. These were all looking pretty good, uh, at different points throughout the day. Priest was ninth on, uh, one of the green white checker restarts. And then he got destroyed. Car got obliterated. McDowell was running sixth. Then he got spun. Uh, Harvick was involved, I believe, in that same spin. And says so a lot of chaos towards the end. And final restart, Ty Gibbs was 11th. McDowell was like 26th. Harvick was like 29th. And Priest was dust. Gibbs actually got his way inside the top 10. Finished there. Uh, See, so that one did cash at plus 430. And McDowell and Harvick, with all the carnage on that last restart as well, they actually did finish 12th and 13th. So... Couldn't quite cash the top 10, but got really close to adding those on as well. So felt good about the process there. Felt good about the results uh, mentioned in the betting guide. Tyler Reddick to win at 9-1 to during practice on Friday. So felt really good about the Cup Series. Could have been better if Priest had stayed in the top 10 or if McDowell had gotten back up there. But overall, pretty happy with how things played out there. Both the Truck Series and the Cup Series. Xfinity Series, not as much, but... Um, Road courses have been a bit of a bugaboo at times for me, so happy to have a decent week this past week at Circuit of the Americas. Next week, Richmond, which should be a whole lot of fun. We'll try to find uh, some time to talk um, some NASCAR probably Thursday after we talk the women's Final Four. I'll talk uh, some NASCAR there, so we'll get you set for Richmond on Thursday on the show this week. As mentioned, though, big uh, week here on the stream or on, on the show. We got Ed coming up tomorrow, breaking down the final four. We're going to have uh, opening day. I'll talk some money lines, my model likes. We'll talk some strikeout props. We'll talk about, you know, national TV games, stuff like that. All coming up Wednesday, women's final four Thursday. We're going to talk about um, MLB on Friday as well. All right here in the same feed. So go search for it, covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts, hit subscribe. And as always, if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star review that does help us out a bunch. We appreciate those of you who have done so already. Also, check us out on the FanDuel YouTube page. Hit subscribe there. Hit the like button if you like what you see. And uh, we appreciate, again, all of you over there as well. Big thank you once again to Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. You can find me on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for tonight. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down the final four. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 